In the vast expanse of the cosmos, planets tend to show up in crowds. But among the thousands of exoplanets astronomers have discovered, there is a strange empty gap, a forbidden zone that separates the two most common types of planets in the universe. This silent void is known as the Radius Valley, or Fulton Gap. And no, this isn't a glitch in our telescopes or a calculation error. It is the smoking gun of a cosmic battle that has raged between stars and planets for billions of years. To understand this valley is to understand one of the most fundamental mechanisms of how planets evolve and survive. Of all the breakthroughs in exoplanet research, the Radius Valley is arguably the most intriguing and revolutionary. It's not a physical wall set up in space, but a pattern that only emerged once we had gathered data on thousands of planets. Think of it as a cosmic fingerprint hidden in the statistics. Here's the reality. While Earth is the largest terrestrial planet in our solar system, the universe's limit for rocky worlds goes much higher. We've found plenty of super-Earths, worlds larger and denser than our own. This proves that Earth isn't the only template for a rocky planet. But here's the mystery. When we look at planets with a radius between 1.6 and 2.2 times that of Earth, the population suddenly crashes. As you can see in this image, it's not easy to find a planet that is two times the radius of the Earth. It's really like a planetary desert. This gap appears repeatedly across different astronomical surveys and datasets. It implies that a universal, powerful evolutionary mechanism is at work. Some planets grow huge, while others stay compact like Earth. But planets that try to stay in that middle ground, they're incredibly fragile. They're unstable, transient, and ultimately doomed. So why do planets seemingly vanish in this specific size range? Are worlds between 1.6 and 2.2 Earth radii naturally cursed? To understand the root cause, we have to realize something crucial. This is a radius valley, not a mass valley. It's not that planets in this mass range can't form. The issue is that planets of similar mass end up with drastically different densities. We all know that gaseous planets have relatively low densities, as their outer layers contain substantial amounts of hydrogen, helium, or water ice. While their rocky cores possess extremely high densities, the overall planetary density is lowered by these light, thin shells. The truth is that during the early developmental stages of larger terrestrial planets, some managed to gravitationally attract and retain their light, expanded gaseous envelopes, while others were stricked down to nothing but high-density bare rocky cores. It is precisely this density polarization that creates a distinct gap in the planetary demographic. Among the leading theories, photoevaporation is considered the primary sculptor of the Radius Valley. It describes a process where planets orbiting close to their host stars are slowly stripped of their atmosphere over eons. It's a long, ruthless filtration process. Here's how it works. Planets in close orbit are bombarded by intense X-rays and extreme ultraviolet radiation from their star. While hydrogen and helium atmospheres are transparent to visible light, they absorb this high-energy radiation like a sponge. This heats the upper atmosphere to extreme temperatures, causing it to expand into a scorching thermal halo. If the gas gets hot enough to overcome the planet's gravity, it escapes. It's literally blown away into space in a supersonic wind. This is where the planet's fate is decided. For low-mass cores under 3 to 4 Earth's mass, they have weaker gravity, the atmospheric escape accelerates, and within a few hundred million years, the gas is gone. All that remains is a bare rocky sphere with a radius smaller than 1.5 Earths. And for high mass cores, usually over 5 Earths mass, they have enough gravity to hold the line. Even if they lose some gas, they retain a thick envelope, keeping their radius above 2 Earths. The radius valley is the dividing line between these two classes of survivors. On one side, you have the stripped down super Earths 
take Kepler 452b for instance, its mass is 3.3 times that of Earth, while its radius is 63% larger. The later discovery TOI 1452b follows a similar pattern with an estimated radius 67% greater than Earth's and a mass 4.8 times our planet's. Have you noticed that the radii both hover around the 1.6 times Earth radius threshold? On the other side of this boundary lie many Neptunes still cloaked in hydrogen and helium atmospheres, such as TOI 421b. Though only 6.7 times Earth's mass, its radius reaches 2.8 times that of Earth. It's also worth noting that many exoplanets initially classified as super-Earths have since been reclassified as mini-Neptunes, such as Gliese 581d, as follow-up data revealed their low densities and high abundance of volatile gases like ammonia. Planets occupying the critical zone between these two categories struggled to survive long-term in their evolutionary trajectories, leaving a statistical void in cosmic statistics. Another possibility is the emergence of ocean planets, or even Hycean planets. Some planets, after losing their atmospheres, retain thick layers of water or ice. Under immense pressure, these transform into supercritical fluids, or high-pressure ice, ultimately forming deep water worlds entirely submerged by oceans. Alternatively, they may preserve hydrogen-rich atmospheres, beneath which liquid water oceans exist. These represent transitional states. Fundamentally, they remain low-mass, shrunken gaseous planets where the light material layers have been reduced to a state dominated by liquid or high-pressure ice. Such planets may eventually continue shedding their lighter constituents, evolving into bare rock planets, or they may maintain a long-term metastable equilibrium between residual atmosphere and deep ocean. However, photoevaporation isn't the only suspect. Astronomers have proposed a second and equally important mechanism, core powered mass loss. Unlike photoevaporation, which relies on the star attacking from the outside, this theory suggests the engine of destruction comes from within. After a rocky core forms, it remains incredibly hot. As it cools over billions of years, that internal heat radiates outward, boiling the atmosphere from the bottom up. This causes the gas to expand and escape. It's literally blown away into space in a supersonic wind. These two mechanisms can both work. Photoevaporation might dominate in the planet's youth, while core-powered mass loss continues the work over the planet's long life. In conclusion, the essence of the Radius Valley is that these medium-sized planets are in an awkward position. Their gravity and magnetic fields aren't strong enough to lock down a thick atmosphere, yet they are big enough to attract a hydrogen-helium envelope initially. But whether it's the intense roasting from their star or the slow burn heat from their own core, that fragile atmosphere is eventually pushed away. So what does this teach us about our own home? The Radius Valley reveals that habitability isn't just about how far you are from your star. It's about a delicate balance between mass and atmosphere. Earth is habitable not just because it's in the Goldilocks zone, but because it threaded the needle of evolution. It didn't become too small to lose its capability to sustain liquid water, nor did it become too massive to keep a suffocating primordial shell of hydrogen and helium. Earth isn't a typical medium-sized planet. It is a survivor, a rare world that landed precisely between two distinct planetary destinies. Anyway, there is still a lot of research needed if we want to be a Type 3 civilization or having a mini Neptune as a clean energy source to solve the climate problem, I guess. Thanks for watching. I'll make another Astro video next time.